Good morning, uh, Detroit Economic Club Young Leaders. Welcome to this year's conference. My name is Curtis Iorio, and I'm the conference chair of the conference titled The Power of You, Leadership and Impact Redefined. We're excited to kick off our second day here today. First, we'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, our platinum sponsor, Motor City Casino and Hotel, as well as all the other sponsors who made this event possible. Thank you all for your support. So I'm just going to be introducing Walter. Um, uh, Walter has a dual role as a chief of staff at Lumber & Co, as well as chief financial officer at Ticker. Previously, he was a management consultant at BTS in New York City and Morgan Franklin in Washington, DC, where he led a multi-million dollar tech transformation project um, for a large financial institution. Walter holds a bachelor's in advertising from Michigan State University. Go green. Go oh, white. <laughs> Go Green and an MBA focused on alternative finance from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, piece up eight town down. He also has a technical certification in core banking connectivity from Cariba. And Walter is an avid sneaker collector and lover of the world travel. And uh, we will see him this afternoon and uh, he will share with us his love of sneakers as well. He's, he's mentioned that to us. <laughs> so I'll hand it to you, Walter. Started. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I want to say welcome to everyone. Um, thank you again to the Detroit Economic Club, the Young Leader Conference, for inviting me and being part of this uh, this wonderful uh, personal development conference. I want to send a shout out to Brian Sierra for you know getting me ready and prep for this meeting. Um, but I'm excited today. Uh, again, it's a privilege to be part of this uh, opening keynote, and uh, today's session is called "I've Got 99 Problems." Now, the punchline is that 99 problems is essentially a euphemism for structured problem solving. And structured problem solving is the art of removing noise to hear and serve clients better. So that's the overall thing that we're going to talk about today. But I want to talk about why this is important for a second. If you do any quick Google search on, you know, world's biggest problems, you're going to come up with, hey, you know, uh, uh, climate change. You're going to come up with uh, racial issues. You're going to come up with uh, income inequality. You're going to come up with a number of different issues and problems that the world faces today. But I believe the number one problem that we have is one of leadership. And what I mean by that, it's a leadership gap in the ability to solve problems. And it's not just problems that we face every day in the larger culture, the larger world. It's problems that we face every day in our, in our daily lives. It doesn't, you know, you might feel this, but the world itself is getting faster. So the way I describe it, the world is becoming more VUCA, more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And we feel that. I remember back in the day, you know, if someone were to uh, give me a call on the cell phone, I would be excited, like I got a phone call. Nowadays, if someone calls me, it's like, oh, wow, they're calling me. There's so much going on. You feel the tension of your day. There's so many things that we're dealing with on a day in and day out, so many problems uh, that you really need to be an expert in solving problems to develop uh, in your career and develop uh, personally and professionally. So that's really what today is about. It is structured problem solving, removing the noise to hear and serve clients better. Um, just to give you a little bit of introduction of who I am, my name is Walter Ward III. Uh, the joke is that the third one's the best one, so there's a fourth one. I don't have any kids yet, uh, so I'm gonna retain that title. Uh, and again, the goal of our session today is to turn chaos into clarity. And this is done best when we can see the entire field, identify and structure problems in a clear way. So um, professionally, you know, I call myself a sheet geek. Again, my undergrad is in advertising and my MBA is kind of focused in alternative investments. And uh, my career, you know, kind of shows that. So I spent seven years in banking, JP Morgan, everything from retail banking, commercial banking, treasury and payments. Uh, went back to school, got my MBA, and I spent the majority of my career post-business school in consulting. So literally doing everything from building strategy gaming scenarios for executives and working on innovation. And, and that it's at, at that point, I was introduced to design thinking, which a lot of this is going to be based on, uh, all the way to my job today, uh, where I'm doing a number of different things uh, in our portfolio of companies. I'll tell a little bit about Lambert & Co. Lambert & Co. is a strategic communications firm that specializes in public relations, investor relations, and integrated marketing. But we also act as a pseudo investment fund, managing sizable investments in a number of innovative companies. So everything from uh, Ticker, which I hold the title of CFO, uh, which is a fintech startup that essentially connects publicly 
you know, the shares that people own with the benefits they get from shareholder, from being a shareholder, to Ninth Wonder, which is a large uh, ad agency based out of Texas, to Lambert Proper. And uh, my main client is this gentleman here, Jeff Lambert, who's our CEO. And uh, we actually share this in common, not just a love for cool things, but uh, we love music, right? So if you notice, there's a QR code embedded here, and there'll be one embedded at the end of the presentation that actually is a special playlist for uh, the attendees of this session. So if you are a hip hop head such as myself uh, and my boss here, then I invite you to check out um, that playlist uh, at the end of the presentation. So all that being said, let's talk about what today's agenda will be. So we're gonna talk about the three types of problems. People don't realize that actually all problems can be grouped into three buckets. We're gonna talk about defining the problem. So defining your problem or whatever problem it is that you're trying to solve for. We're going to talk about problem statement, so being able to express that uh, problem that you're trying to solve and what the complications are. And then we're going to talk about communicating impact and results. We're going to do that by walking through a framework that allows you to look at impact and results. And while I'm teaching you to communicate impact and results, I'm also going to be teaching you to think in terms of impact and results. So again, the four areas that we're talking about today, the three types of problems, defining the problem, problem statements, and then also communicating impact and results. All right, let's get into it. The three types of problems. And we're gonna start with the first type of problem. It's the simplest problem. It's actually called a simple problem. Simple problems happen all the time. They've been observed in many situations and in many forms. The defining characteristic of a simple problem is that it shows up often and it can be solved by a repeatable solution or a formula. So I'm gonna say that again. Simple problems, the first time a problem are things that happen often, and they happen in a number of different iterations, and they can be solved by some type of formula, right? So an example of a simple problem would be making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. If you have a problem that you're hungry and you want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, it happens all the time. There's pretty much only one way to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So solving a simple problem is heavily relying on the plan it must be as repeatable as the problem, like making a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Uh, that formula must produce a standardized result. The more standardized, the better. In other words, like, you know, some of us make good peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, some not so good, but I mean, there's not a whole lot of variation between a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then also expertise isn't necessary to solve a simple problem. So in other words, you know, there aren't very, very many people that have a chef hat that says, hey, I'm an expert and making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So again, simple problems are repeatable. They show up in a number of different iterations and they can be solved formulaically, meaning that there's something that you can do to almost automate creating or solving a simple problem. Now I have a question for you all. What's another example of a simple problem that you see in everyday life? So I'm gonna ask you to unmute for one second. Anyone can shout out what's another example of a simple problem you see? I would say forgetting my passwords. Forgetting your passwords. That is, a, that is a simple problem that comes up. It happens all the time. And it happens in probably a number of different applica applications. Great example. What's another example? Simple problem. Problems that happen all the time and they can be solved without having any expertise. Don't everyone jump in. I waking up late. Waking up late is a problem that is a simple problem that can be solved pretty formulaically and it doesn't take a whole lot of expertise to wake up on time I'm with you. I love it. I'm with that. <laughs> All right. Let's look at the next type of problem. The next type of problem is called a complex problem. Complex problems are different from simple problems because they cannot be automated or solved by a simple formula. They can sometimes be broken down into a series of simple problems, but there's no straightforward recipe or formula to solve them. So success frequently requires multiple people or often multiple teams and specialized expertise, right? So um, a lot of times unanticipated difficulties are gonna be present and timing and coordination become serious concerns here. So a great example of this would be, you hear a funny noise in your car, you know something's wrong, you don't know exactly what it is, right? So you gotta take it somewhere to someone who has expertise to solve it and they've gotta do some things to figure out what the problem is and solving that problem is gonna take some sequencing or project management. So again, complex problems are heavily reliant upon a plan and expertise. Automation is not possible today because we know in the future automation comes to everything. 
There are many known unknowns, meaning that you know something is wrong, but you don't know what it is. So you hear the funny sound, but you got to take the car in. Causality can only be determined after action is taken. Then sequencing and project management are always required to solve complex problems. So I'm going to call this out too. And you're going to hear me say this several times in the presentation. I'm a huge advocate of, you know, uh, project management. I took a project management course. You know, and I, I advocate that every professional needs to spend some time in a very defined project management course, learning about waterfall and agile, because it's going to teach you to think in a certain way, right? So it, to solve a complex problem, sequencing and project management are always required to solve, okay? The third and final type of problem is a chaotic problem. Chaotic problems are black swan events. Chaotic problems are distinguishable by two factors. They're infrequent and they have multiple unknowns and expertise and experience help very little. Chaotic problems are scary, but if we remain calm, review the information around us and deconstruct the problem into small components. We can downgrade a chaotic problem to a complex one that can be solved. So a chaotic problem is a war breaks out, uh, a flood happens in the city, the power grid goes down, or you know, something that's more specific to your organization, something that you didn't think would ever happen, happens, right? You know, some new competitor comes on the scene to disrupt uh, what you're doing. Those are, are chaotic problems, things where expertise helps very little because they don't happen that often. So there's no one that has the title of chief, you know, power grid, get back up or if things go down, right? Because it's not something that happens all the time, right? The expertise has to be in solving the problem, right? And that's where leadership comes in. And that's why we're having this session. To solve chaotic problems or really any type of problem, your expertise needs to be in solving problems, right? As leaders, we want that to be, you know, a core skill set, the ability to solve problems. So now that we talk about the three types of problems, I've got a question for you. Pop quiz. What are the three types of problems? <laughs> Caught you. Three types of problems. I see people in the chat. You can say it out loud too. Don't be afraid to unmute and say it. Simple, complex, and chaotic. Simple, complex, and chaotic. Thank you, Steffi. That is correct. Simple, complex, and chaotic are the three types of problems or three buckets that problems can fit into. Thank you. All right. Now that we know what buckets problems can fit into, let's talk about defining the problem. Okay. So defining the problem, solving a problem is part of a very structured process. So structured problem solving is a, um, you know, a, a, a framework that you can use to solve a problem. It's uh, the act of defining the problem, determining the cause of the problem, identifying, prioritizing, and selecting alternatives for a solution, and implementing and measuring a solution. So I put in measuring because oftentimes, you know, people don't measure. They don't think about measuring the results of whatever they're doing. Uh, there's an old Quickenism, I believe, for people that, that have worked at Quicken that says, you know, whatever gets measured gets improved. Uh, I don't know who said that originally, but it's, it's, a, it's a truism. Whatever gets measured gets improved. So it's important to think about as you're implementing a solution, you got to think about how you're going to measure. So for today's purposes, we don't have time to go through all four steps. We're going to focus primarily on this first step, defining the problem. And defining the problem has three elements. You want to define the problem to where there's low ambiguity, it's fact-based, and it considers impact and occurrence. So I'm going to say it again in case you're writing it down. Defining the problem is about getting it to a point of low ambiguity, making sure that it's fact-based, and considering impact and occurrence. Anyone have any thoughts on what I may mean by that? I know it's morning. We got to have fun together. What, what do you think I mean by low ambiguity being fact based and considering impact and occurrence? Ultimately, we've got a lot of um, we've got a lot of information about that. You know, we're trying to bring in more information about whatever the problem is, and we have some insight, or we're getting insight about how it may affect other individuals as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's uh, that's exactly part of it. Um, you know, you hear people say things like, hey, this thing is broke, right? Or this thing doesn't work, right?
right? You know, that's not really defining the problem because there's high ambiguity. I don't know what the thing is and I don't know what it doesn't work is, right? So we wanna get it to a point where the problem is very defined. So the best way I can describe this to kind of describe how we define a problem is the game life. So when I was a kid, there was this game called Life of Board Game. And essentially it was, you know, you're on the journey of life and your family, you encountered a number of different problems and there were different solves or fixes for it, right? So uh, the way I can describe this and the way we can introduce this idea of defining a problem to low ambiguity, fact-based and making sure that we consider impact and occurrences to understand first off, that everyone is on a journey to somewhere to do something and the best problem solvers empathize with people on that journey. So uh, I believe in the pre-video, we saw the CEO of Imagine Entertainment and he said the power of you is about empathy, right? And I can't stress that enough. Being a great problem solver, being a great leader is all about empathizing with people. You have to be empathetic to the needs of people and what they're going through, right? And I'm gonna explain why. So again, Everyone's on a journey, right? And we're on multiple journeys at different times. So for example, I got up this morning. The, the irony is I live two blocks away from the office, but I still got dressed. I got to the car, came out the garage, drove the two blocks over here, parked in this garage, came in the building, got dressed, came and set up the, you know, the presentation. There was a journey for me to get to work. At the same time I'm on this journey to get to work, I had to get coffee, right? So like I have to get coffee and feed myself, right? So there's a journey there. Um, and all these different journeys that we're on, they're problems that we encounter. So the best problem solvers know how to observe people on a journey and solve whatever problem that they have, right? So I got a question for you all. How do you empathize with people? How do you empathize with people? Not a trick question, but just an honest question. I'm just curious of the responses. How do you empathize with people? Talk less, listen more. Talk less, listen more. I love it. Yes, 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 yes. What else? What else we got? Try to see things from their perspective, um, sort of live in their shoes and see what's happening. And then I would take it probably one step further, which is showing compassion by actually taking action. Yes, 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 yes. Talk less, listen more. See the world from their perspective. Adding compassion to actually take action to solve the problem, right? I love it. I love it. One other, one other comment, how, how else do you empathize with people? Anyone else have something else before we move forward? I would reach out to see if there's any um, other commonalities of, of what that person is experiencing. So it, maybe it's just not a one-off issue or a problem, it's a collective. So you may have discovered something more important to the group that one person has been experiencing first and there could be other issues of the same problem. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. So I explain it this way, all your answers are great. To sum it up, essentially that people on a journey have a job to be done, right? So it's like a good book. You know, in a good book, someone's on a journey to do something, right? And uh, the job to be done is something that people on a journey are trying to do, right? So everyone has a job that needs to get done, not a task, but a core jobs. And jobs are things that human have always done, but the methods change. The catch is that getting a job done isn't easy. And the reason it isn't easy is because there's nearly always complications or blockers and good problem solvers center themselves on the job to be done and removing the blockers that surround it. So I'll explain it this way. Since the beginning of time, humans have needed to move things from point A to point B, right? That is a job that's needed to be done since the invention of humans. Things have needed to go from point A to point B. Now, if you were to go back a thousand years ago and say, well, how do people do that job, you'd say, well, they probably, you know, had a, a horse or some other kind of animal that dragged things from point A to point B, right? And there are problems with that. If you go back 500 years ago or 300 years ago, you might find out, you know, people attach an animal to a carriage and that's how they move things from point A to point B. If you go back, you know, 100 years ago, you might say, you know, people put things on a train and that's how they moved it from point A to point B. You know, 75 years ago, people put things in a car and they moved things from point A to point B. 50 years ago, it's an airplane moving things from point A to point B. You know, 25 years from now, it'll be a drone moving things from point A to point B. But the point is, is that the job itself, moving things from point A to point B, has never changed. It's always existed. And it's usually existed in the context of someone on some sort of journey to complete their job or to, to do something in life that had to move things from point A to point B. So that's how I want to 
to start to think about how we empathize with people and solve their problems. We're gonna empathize with the fact that they have a job to be done and their complications to getting that job done, okay? Now, how do we empathize with people that have a job to get done as they're going on their daily journey, right? Well, the first part is we have to observe data, right? So two things you gotta notice to define a problem is the job that people are trying to do and the data that surround that job. So the way we look at this is data, you know, as the, according to Wikipedia, is individual facts, statistics, or items of information, often numeric, that are collected through observation, right? So I call data just stuff that you see around you, right? And the idea is that you wanna take the data that you observe around someone trying to get a job done and distill it into an insight, uh, which is essentially a story, you know, essentially a story of, you know, what that data means, right? So uh, a great example is that of this is um, there's a, a, uh, a fast food company, I won't say who, but this fast food company wanted to sell more milkshakes once upon a time. And uh, they essentially brought in a consultant to say, hey, how do we sell more milkshakes? And this consultant said, hey, we're gonna ask a different question. We're gonna ask people for what job do they hire a milkshake to do, right? And that's a question that you can't ask people because people don't know why they hire a milkshake. It even sounds weird. So all, the only way you can get that answer is by observing the data around people trying to uh, hire a milkshake. And in this particular situation, what they realize is that the majority of milkshakes are actually sold in the morning. They're sold to people that have a, a, a commute to work over 21 minutes. And the people that bought them didn't eat again until much later in the day. So what they realize is that people were buying milkshakes not because of the taste and not because of the flavor per se but they were buying them because they were using them as essentially a meal supplement in the morning so this particular fast food restaurant added a thickener to the milkshake so it takes longer uh to drink right and it didn't melt as fast and what they and they started advertising to people during drive time in the mornings and their milkshake sales shot up because they realized what the actual job was that people were hiring a milkshake to do Follow me, any questions on any of this so far? Am I making sense or am I talking crazy? I'm assuming that I'm not talking crazy based on, the, based on no one responding. So I'm gonna say, we understand the job to be done. So the essence of strategy, your problem solving is choosing what not to do. And sound strategy, your problem solving starts with having the right goal. And that right goal is removing the blockers to the job to be done, right? So. We're gonna start with something called a job statement, right? So again, a problem is gonna be anything that's blocking someone from getting a job done, right? An issue done. Um, so a job statement is a declarative statement that you understand what the base job is, right? I want to get ice cream. So I'm gonna tell you another story about a company called Square that we all know and love. And I'm gonna tell you how Square came about from observing people on a, their daily journey, particularly their shopping journey, and the job to get done of actually making a transaction, right? So I'm gonna use sneakers, for example, and I'm gonna show you how this comes about. Square, you know, they realize that when people are on their shopping journey, and particularly at the point of the journey where they make a transaction, things were weird. So if you think about it, when you go and buy something, it's a naturally relational experience, right? Uh, so I'm a sneaker head. I've got over 40 pairs of sneakers. I was just a sneaker con this past weekend. I love sneakers, okay? And when I buy sneakers, I'm gonna use Nojo Kicks up the street from me. Uh, as an example, I walk into Nojo Kicks. Someone's gonna walk up to me. They're gonna say, hey, what are we looking for? I'm gonna say, I'm looking for a pair of Jordan 1s. They're gonna say, oh, great. This pair is gonna work really good with your outfit. What do you plan on doing? Hey, I'm gonna to go to the Monarch Club. I'm gonna hang out on the roof. I'm gonna kick it for a minute, you know, and I wanna show off my Jordan 1 sneakers. And then we're gonna have this very relational conversation around, you know, what I wanna do with these sneakers and how they work. What's weird is when I get to the point where I wanna make a transaction, so I wanna make a transaction being my job statement, something that was very relational becomes almost adversarial or transactional. They go behind a desk, and I'm on the other side of the desk and we were just conversational and relational and now they're taking my money and I'm taking sneakers and there's literally a barrier between us. 
So Square observed this journey. They observed the journey of someone trying to shop. And at the point of the journey where they had a job and they wanted to make a payment, and they said something's weird about that. Um, actually, you know, it should be relational all the way throughout, right? So they took their job statement. I want to get ice cream in this case is what we're going to use, or in their case, I want to make a transaction. And they added some modifiers to it to make it more insightful, right? Because again, to, the, to define a problem, you've got to get to a point of low ambiguity. So we're going to say, I want to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on Saturday afternoon. In Square's case, they said, hey, I want to make a transaction, but it has to be anywhere at any time to keep the relational aspect open. And that's really how Square came about, right? They're, if you think about it, it is all about making a transaction anywhere at any time to keep the relational aspect of the business going. So it's not as adversarial, right? Everyone follow me? Any questions? I know I'm kind of speeding through this for time. Um, but again, in our case, we're going to use the example of I want to get ice cream. And as we observe data, we turn into insights, we realize that I want to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on Saturday afternoon, right? So that's my job statement. I want to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on Saturday afternoon, but they're going to be blockers to me getting ice cream in downtown Detroit on Saturday afternoon. Any ideas of what some of the blockers may be? I think a shop that's open in downtown Detroit for ice cream. Typically, most shops are open Monday through Friday because that's when all the business people are downtown working. So it could be challenging for to find an actual shop that's open. Exactly. It could be a challenge to find a shop that's actually open. Uh, what, what are some other thoughts or some other issues that could come up with me trying to find ice cream in downtown Detroit on a Saturday afternoon? It's got the flavor you want. Does it have the flavor that I want? That's a good one, right? Do they have the flavor that I want, right? I love um, that. How about parking? Where do I park? Where do I park? Like, where am I going to park in downtown Detroit? I mean, I want to get ice cream. It's like a quick trip. I mean, do I, do I want to spend all my time, like, driving around looking for a spot? Maybe we're in the middle of December and you can't find ice cream in Michigan outside in the middle of December. <laughs> exactly. Could be that, too. Could be that, too. All right, so let's look at it this way. So before we get into how to solve that problem and start to think about that problem, I'm going to ask you, what are the four steps to structure problem solving? I know it was a while back. All right, I'll give you a hint. Define, define and ideate were the first two. Yep. Define, ideate, evaluate, implement, and measure. Those are the yep. four steps. Um, for the purposes of today, we're going to focus on just defining, and we'll get a little bit into ideating, but then we'll bring us back to this. So now that we have reviewed what the four steps of the structure problem solving are, we are going to empathize with someone on a journey on a Saturday afternoon with the job to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on a Saturday afternoon. And the way we empathize with people is by observing all the data around their, their journey to that job. But we gotta empathize around a person, right? So in this case, we're gonna use Kevin Hart. I like Kevin Hart, I think he's hilarious. And I would love to see him in downtown Detroit getting an ice cream cone. So in this case, we're gonna create an empathy map using Kevin Hart as our subject. And we're observing him on his job to be done of getting this ice cream cone in downtown Detroit on a Saturday afternoon. And then what we do is we're gonna literally think about, we're gonna empathize with Kevin. So we're gonna to listen to him by way of watching him. We're, we're gonna you know, think about what is he thinking? We wanna get into what is he feeling? We wanna think about what is he doing? And he may be even saying as he's trying to do this. So question for you, if Kevin Hart is in downtown Detroit and he's trying to get ice cream on a Saturday afternoon, what do you think he's thinking? What do you think he's feeling? What's he doing? Think about the journey of getting the ice cream. So we had someone, so he's trying to find ice cream. So he's probably Googling ice cream shops in downtown Detroit. Um, so he's probably thinking, where can I get good ice cream? He's probably feeling frustrated about finding ice cream. He's probably thinking about, man, where am I going to park? Man, like trying to search a Google for one, like who's open, where are they at, right? 
So the idea of doing an empathy map is literally you're going to think about a person on that journey with that job to get done. And you're going to think about literally, like, what are they thinking? What are they doing? What are they feeling? And you're going to be literally writing down as many of these things as you can, right? As many of these things as you can, as quickly as you can. And what you'll find is that eventually you're going to get to a point where some of these can be grouped together, right? And when they're grouped together, it essentially means that, hey, this is probably a universal theme that other people challenge, you know, or encounter in trying to solve this problem, right? So there are probably many people that feel frustrated about finding ice cream. And there are probably many people that feel, uh, you know, frustrated trying to park their car to get ice cream in downtown Detroit. Follow me there. So again, we're empathizing, we're creating this empathy map for uh, whoever is trying to get this job done. We're thinking about what they're thinking. We're thinking about what they're feeling. We're thinking about what they're doing. We're taking note of that. We're getting this information from observing the data around them doing that job. And then we can make a problem statement, right? So a problem statement is, I want to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on Saturday afternoon. Remember, that was the job statement is that first part. I want to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on Saturday afternoon. Where it becomes a problem statement is we're defining what the challenges are, but it's difficult to do because I don't know where to go and I can't park easily, right? So again, we said probably universally, people are feeling frustrated about finding the ice cream and they're probably having issues trying to park their car. So our problem statement is the job statement plus the modifiers, the difficulties that go along with it. So it looks something like this. I want to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on Saturday afternoon, but it's difficult to do because I, one, don't know where to go, and two, I can't park easily, right? So now that we know what the problem statement is, we can actually start to ideate solutions around this. So in this case, to do it well, you got to think about impact and results, right? Or impact and results, or likelihood and impact is another way to say it. So to do that, I'm going to teach you another framework, which is actually looking at things through the lens of how often they happen and what's the impact if they do happen. So likelihood and impact for those of you who may be project managers or product managers, this stuff is you know, kind of familiar to you, but for everyone else, this might be new. Uh, but the likelihood is that you know, a blocker, right? So a blocker to a job you know, can be defined as an issue or a risk. Uh, in strategic thought and project management, software development, executive leadership, or whatever, all risks are evaluated on the dimensions of likelihood. So often, how often this thing happens and what the impact is of it actually happening, right? So now there's many tools you can use to kind of, you know, measure impact and likelihood, you know, but if you don't have those tools, you can do it with simple pencil and paper. Uh, the way you're going to do it is you're going to create a matrix of likelihood on one axis and impact on the other. And then we're literally going to plot issues on the matrix using red, yellow, and green tags above. And then if possible, we want to quantify with specific numbers whenever we can, right? So again, traditionally, risks or issues can be tracked in an issue, tracker, or registrar. So as a chief of staff, I literally have like an Excel uh, document that has all the projects I'm working on at any given point in time. And I have the issues that pop up. I have some issues that have never happened. And literally, I'm just looking for potential fixes if something does happen, right? So you could use a tool like Jira or Backlog or Monday.com to track those particular issues. Or um, if you're someone like me, you feel fairly comfortable in Excel and you know there's not you know like a you know multi-million dollar project with you know a bunch of different teams, you can use Excel uh, to track your issues and figure out what impact and results are. But if you got pencil and paper, you literally on a piece of paper on one, one axis, you're going to put impact and the other, you're going to have likelihood. And uh, the way you would read this is that this lower left-hand corner stands for low impact, for low impact and low likelihood. And this upper right-hand corner stands for high impact and high likelihood. And you're literally going to think about all those blockers and you're going to plot them on this matrix based on likelihood and impact. So, uh, the point being is that you don't want to be in a situation where you're solving a problem that has a low likelihood and low impact. You know, you ever encounter people and you're wondering, why are you worried about this thing? Like it would never happen. And if it did, it wouldn't even impact anything. Um, and they're, they're working on that when there's some problem that's actually like, you know, a monumental, if this thing happens, it'll destroy the enterprise and no one's worrying about that. 
uh, the way you can change that culture, that mindset in, in people that you work with or your teams is by getting them to think about likelihood and impact when it comes to solving problems. So I want to point this out because it's very important to understanding how to one, articulate a problem statement, and then two, it's also vitally important to understand this framework when you think about how do you ideate solutions to a particular problem. So that being said, I want to revisit what we've learned and, talk, and talked about up to this point before we get into questions and make this more conversational. Uh, we talked about the three types of problems, which are, anyone remember what the three types of problems are? Simple, complex, that's two. Chaotic. Yep, simple, complex, and chaotic. And uh, let's say one of the three, what, what's something that defines a simple problem? Anyone can answer. Formulaic solutions. Real life solutions and a simple problem happens often and it can be solved kind of formulaically, right? Like it's, it happens often and it doesn't take a whole lot of expertise to solve a simple problem. Um, what's something that defines a chaotic problem? It's kind of a black swan event and uh, even experts aren't necessarily equipped to resolve them because they're not typical issues that they run into. Exactly, exactly. Or the expertise has to be the problem solving approach, if you will. Love it. Great answers. Great answers. Okay. We also talked about defining the problem and the four steps in the structure problem solving process are... Define, ideate, evaluate, implement. My man, my man, thank you, absolutely. And we only focus today on defining the problem just because it takes a lot of time to go through the others. So defining the problem has something called a job to what? If we're empathizing with people to solve a problem, they're on a journey to do a job what? to be done. That's right, a job to be done. My man, my man. And when we define a job to be done and we think about the blockers, the issues that come up, we have a problem statement, right? And what are some tools that we can use to track the problems that may come up? Empathy map and the likelihood impact nine box. Yes, using that likelihood and impact uh, matrix helps you think about, you know, is this even something that's worth solving or is this something that I need to solve right now, right? What about uh, tracking them? I mentioned maybe some software tools, you know, what, what tools are out there? There was one that we all have access to. Excel, Excel Gyra, Excel. Monday. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, communicating impact and results. Um, helps you get to low ambiguity. Maybe someone could try explaining what would it sound like to communicate, uh, let me see, the likelihood of someone having the issue of parking when it comes to finding ice cream in downtown Detroit. Like what would that sound like someone describing that problem in terms of likelihood? If you're trying to get ice cream in downtown Detroit on a Saturday afternoon, there is a very high likelihood that you are going to have extreme difficulty finding parking. And therefore, there, the impact to your journey is that it's going to take you a long time to get ice cream on a Saturday afternoon in downtown Detroit. Donovan, I love it, man. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. I mean, that's simply what it is, right? So we talked about the three types of problems that you know everything can be bucketed into. We talked about defining the problem. We talked about problem statements. We talked about communicating impact and results. I mean, I think at this point, you all are like essentially master problem solvers. If I had like some sort of certification to give you, I would like dub thee now as master problem solver. So the only thing I have for you now is like questions. Like, what, I mean, any questions about anything that we've said? Any, anything that, that came up that made sense, didn't make sense? Hey, how do I apply this to my job? Any questions like that? I have a question. Uh, when you, if there is a problem or issue identified within an organization and you're bringing in thought leadership 
um, but it's not resolved. What, how do you change the empathetic map or how do you look at it to where it's looked at again or there's additional resources put towards resolving that issue? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So a lot of this stuff comes out of the design thinking movement, the innovation movement, right? Because, you know, our world is moving so fast and problems are happening so much. One of the things that you need to have in place in a culture for this stuff to work is you have to have like freedom to explore, right? So in very hierarchical organizations, right? That are very like, you know, I'm using this term not in a derogatory way, but to explain like that are more militaristic where there's like, you know, a structured hierarchy and people are afraid to make mistakes. This kind of thought is not gonna work. You kind of have to give people freedom to explore and to make mistakes for this type of thing to work. So a lot of times when I hear a statement like that, it makes me think, well, that organization is probably very hierarchical or people are afraid of making mistakes. And before you can even implement this kind of stuff, you have to deal with that culture, particularly in the leadership to get to the point where you could actually implement this. But great question. Hey, Walter, um, where can we get information on the remaining four steps, uh, the ideate, evaluate and implement and measure? Yes. So. Uh, the, the short answer is invite me out to, uh, to break it down for you, right? Um, the longer answer is um, there's no like, you won't find a, um, a bucket that says, hey, this is how you do the other four steps. Those other four steps are essentially Walter Ward uh, additives that I kind of put together based on you know, my research and experience. There's no like one document that's gonna break all that down. It's something that I, I can give you information on or you can invite me out to, to do a session on. So I don't know if that answers your question. What else we got out there? What other questions we have? How do you keep, um, so you have ideate and evaluate and I translate those into discuss and then debate. How do you keep the debate from um, prematurely entering the discussion? Yes. So very good question. So there's two ways, right? Number one is everyone has to understand that you have to suspend judgment, right? So we have a tendency when someone throws out an idea to say, oh, that won't work because of X, Y, and Z, right? And we kind of shut it down. And innovative thought and problem solving you never want to do that. You want to get as many ideas out as possible. And the way you do that is you got to train everyone to say, hey, no one shuts any idea down. The question has to be, what would, be, what would need to be true for that to happen, right? So instead of saying, hey, that can't happen because of X, Y, and Z, the provocation has to be, what would need to be true for that to happen? So that has to be the mindset in those sessions. No one is allowed to shoot any idea down. The question has to be, what would need to be true for that to happen, that's number one. Number two is making small bets. So anytime someone comes up with an idea or a solution to a problem, they also have to come up with a way that they can test it on a small level. All right, you got this really cool idea, this really cool solution. Now show me how you're gonna be able to test that fast without spending a lot of money and without a lot of impact. And though, if you have those two things, you know, making sure everyone is doing small bet tests and no one is shooting ideas down, they have to ask the question, what would need to be true for this to happen? It avoids those situations and, and those ideation sessions. A great question. What other questions we have? We probably have time for another, really two or three questions before I give you the, uh, the gift at the end. Walter, are you coming to the networking tonight? And which style Jordans are you going to pick to wear? I will be at the networking event tonight. And I think I'm going to wear my self-lacing Jordan 11 adapts. Okay. I'll bring my Jordan 1s. We'll, we'll compare kicks, so. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm looking forward to that. All right. I mean, if there are no other questions, and I, I've got a gift for you guys. I've got a gift. Now, before I give you this gift, right, I'm going to give you my contact information, right? So thank you. I hope you have a great morning. That's how you get a hold of me on 
uh, uh, Instagram and Twitter. I'm really active on Instagram and I'm really active on LinkedIn. So like you can, my name, LinkedIn is Walter the third. But before I give you this gift, all right, it's a playlist. I gotta let you know, it's not necessarily a work safe playlist. So don't like get the playlist and then like start playing it in the office. You probably wanna have some headphones on or wait till you get to the car. But it has some bangers on it. It's called the 99 Problems Playlist to coincide with uh, this session here. Um, actually, when you, when you use that QR code, it's gonna take you to my link tree. So you'll see all my contact information to my personal website. You'll see, you'll be able to email me. You can see some like blog posts and articles I wrote. You know, one of them is on leadership lessons learned from Jay-Z songs. I'm gonna let you know that it's probably, it's my favorite uh, article that I've written. Um, so you'll see all that there and you'll see the playlist at the bottom. And you'll see the 99 Problems playlist along with some other playlists. You know, I grew up in the church, so I literally go from Jay-Z to like Hillsong. So I'm just letting you know. It's, it's a wide, it's a wide, uh, a wide um, you know, playlist. I'm, I'm giving you that. And uh, with saying that, I mean, if there are no other questions, I just want to say I really appreciate the time to speak to you all. And I hope um, everyone uh, learns something that they can apply in their everyday job or in their everyday life. And, uh, thank you again for allowing me to speak to you all.